Good. Hopefully the recording is on now. I'm not sure how I can tell. Yes, I think uh, it's on because I see a flashing red dot. <clears throat> okay, so let me begin again. <laughs> Good morning to everyone and welcome to my first ever Zoom class. As you just gathered, I'm a bit of an amateur at Zoom. I have used it a couple of times, including once for an international internet seminar, but uh, I've never taught a class on Zoom before, so let's see how it goes. We get an unusual view of each other. You get to see my uh, office, my home office, which is my backdrop is a bunch of uh, math books, which are my beloved yellow books that keep me company when I'm in lockdown. So this class is going to be run in rather an unusual fashion. Um, I hope all of you have seen the course web page which is, uh, I'm sure if you Google Comp 598 Prakash, you can find the URL. It's, uh, <clears throat> it contains two documents of some importance. One is the course outline, which gives, uh, amongst other things, the grading policy, which I will outline in a moment. Um, and it contains the lecture schedule, which might be subject to relatively minor modifications, but more or less we will follow it as it is written. And I see that it is a good idea to plug the power in. Here goes. Okay. <clears throat> so administrative matters. This course is intended to be a substitute for Comp 330. So several of you asked me, will this count and so on? Answer is yes, it does. If you successfully finish this course, you have completed the Comp 330 requirement. That being said, it's not exactly equivalent to Comp 330. It is more like Comp 330 plus plus. I have tried to restrict it to mainly honors students. Um, and I'm going to, Comp 330 itself is taught at rather a mathematical level. This one is going to be taught at an even more mathematical level. So the fundamental thing that I'm going to ask of you on your assignments is real proofs, not BS arguments. Okay, so a real proof. The teaching assistant is Michael Woman, who's an honors math CS student. Well, he was, now he's a master's student. And uh, he, if possible, has even more stringent standards of mathematical rigor. So as I told him and we agreed, this will be graded like it's a math class in terms of quality of proof. There are a few things which are not proofs and there are some things where it would be extremely tedious to write down a formal thing where a sketch of the idea is what we're asking for. Uh, but by and large, I would still like to see a cogently argued presentation of whatever it is you're presenting. Now, um, let me say a bit about how the assignments are going to work. Assignment one has, is prepared. Right after this lecture, I'll put it on the course website. And um, it contains 10 questions. It'll be due the following Monday. So there'll be a total of four assignments. Each one will count for 20%. Then there will be a final exam also worth 20% and I'm trying to get special permission to use an unorthodox grading scheme for the final. So the grading scheme for the final that I would like and which has not yet been approved is an oral exam. There is no denying that there is a, that oral exams are absolutely the best way to tell whether the student has actually understood the material. Um, so I'm waiting for permis permission to do that. If I don't get it, it'll be a take home final, like an extended homework assignment. Okay, so there's a lot of you. I was originally expecting maybe 10 students. Instead, I got close to 40. And let me just see if there are any participants waiting to come in. No, okay. Um, <clears throat> So it's going to be pretty much impossible at the fast pace at which this is running to mark all those assignments ourselves. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to post solutions. We will ask you to grade your 
own assignments and tell us what you got. We will grade two questions, maybe three questions chosen at random or, well, not at random, but chosen by us, but un unrevealed in advance, which ones we're grading. And if we see people just casually giving themselves full marks, then we will check and say, is that what we would have really thought? Um, so we will be keeping an eye on it, but we're also trusting you to grade your own assignments. And as the trust builds and you get a better tune of what uh, marks are appropriate, I think that should work reasonably well. So maybe this is a good time to ask for any queries. If you want to ask me a query directly right now, you can unmute yourself and ask. Any queries? Let me switch to gallery view to see. Anyone has any question? Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> so for the topics, if you look at the lecture schedule, the first week is more or less what I would cover in the first month of comp 330 with a couple of additional topics. So those are Kleine algebras. So one of the important things to learn is the correct pronunciation of this name. It's definitely not clean. <laughs> it's clay knee, as if your knee is made of clay. A lot of people say cleany, but uh, Kleine himself <laughs> said cleany. So uh, we'll try and say that. I also sometimes slip into saying cleany, but uh, clean is right out. So <clears throat> we will uh, study a bit about Kleene algebras. We will study a bit about duality, which is a, a topic close to my heart. But other than that, most of the material is straight out of Comp 330 for the first week. The second week is almost entirely new material that you wouldn't see in a regular Comp 330 class. And finally, the third uh, module, which is basically the last week and a half, is an enriched version of what you would see in Comp 330. So when I normally teach Comp 330, people tend to be very happy with the first module where they're drawing automata and it's almost a bit like a design thing. And they tend to be completely bewildered in the third part. And it's, it's because it's not that the constructions are so complicated, but the logic is unusual for them. So people have a hard time grasping the logic of reduction. I'm hoping that this class, which I'm assuming is a more uh, advanced class, people will not be so befuddled by the logic of reduction and I can go at a faster pace and do more advanced things. And I have in mind a number of advanced things like a study of the arithmetic hierarchy to some extent and a study of some intricate uh, constructions like the finite, finite injury argument. I think participants are trying to come in. Let me see. Anyone? Oh, Stefan. Okay. Hi, Stefan. Are you in? Okay, very good. So <clears throat> let's uh, get started. Anybody has any questions about how grading is going to proceed, how the final exam is going to work, the rate of lecture schedules, the pace? No? Okay, good. Oh, other things are cropping up on my Uh, somebody decided he would not take the class. Mar marvelous. Okay, here we go. So, oops. So is that the chat? Rosie, are there things happening on the chat that I can't see? Um, Maria made a good pun. <laughs> Maria made a good pun. Huh? Okay, I'm just going to see if people are trying to get in. Anybody trying to get in? No? 
What does four more mean? Chat. Okay, very good. How do I see the chat? Can I see the chat? I don't want to miss Maria's pun. Uh, the trouble with screen sharing is that all the usual controls disappear. Right. Uh, she asked, what about Kleenex algebras? Ah, yes. <laughs> Very important in times like this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Always blow your algebras into a Kleenex. Um, all right. So let me begin with the first topic, which will be perhaps seeming quite banal for those of you who are expecting to be thrown into category theory on day one. Uh, so let me begin with some, whoa, draw, yes, okay, with some very basic things. So first thing I'm going to uh, uh, describe is what's called an equivalence relation. An equivalence relation R on a set S is a set of pairs so an equivalence relation itself is a set and can be ordered by inclusion is a set of pairs such that uh, <clears throat> one so we're going to write, we write X, R, Y for the pair X, Y, Z, and R. Technically, we should write this pair X, Y, Z, and R, but I'm going to write it as X, R, Y, meaning X is related to Y. So condition one is everything is related to itself. If X is related to Y, then Y is related to X. And if X is related to Y and Y is related to Z, then X is related to Z. This property is called transitivity. This one is called symmetry. And this one is called reflexivity. Okay, so I'm going to assume that everybody is familiar with this concept, an equivalence rel relation. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> we will write square brackets X to be the set of things such that X is related to Y. And such a thing is called an equivalence class. Okay, so I'm assuming these are all known concepts. So I'm going a bit fast. Uh, the set of equivalence classes forms a partition. Of S. So partition means it divides it into a family of disjoint subsets, which uh, between them cover the whole of S. So S is broken up into disjoint pieces like this. There cannot be non-trivial overlap. If two equivalence classes overlap, they have to be the same. Okay, why is that true? Prove it yourself, please. So why do I talk about equivalence relations? Because one thing we will do quite often is we'll have some kind of set of something or the other, usually states of an automaton. We'll recognize that in some way or the other, several of these states are equivalent with respect to some property of interest. And then we cluster those things all together. So we are going to be taking the set and instead of viewing it as a set of elements, we'll view it as the smaller set of its equivalence classes. This construction is called a quotient and we'll write it like this, S slash R. So it looks like the division notation and we'll use the phrase quotient. We will quotient the set S by the equivalence relation R. So this is the set of equivalence classes. Okay, equivalence relations are baby stuff. Slightly more advanced is the concept of partial order. So 
just as an equivalence relation is an abstraction of the notion of equality, a partial order is an abstraction of the notion of the numerical less than or equal to, equal to that we're used to from arithmetic. But the word partial, the adjective partial in partial order means, unlike in arithmetic, it's not the case that every two elements in a set can be compared. So this is kind of an abstraction of the notion of comparison. It's not numerical, it's a qualitative notion of comparison. I'm admitting a participant. Just for future reference, I'm not going to be constantly interrupting the class to admit uh, late entrants, so please be on time. Okay, so again, like in equivalence relation, this is a binary relation. on a set S and it's usually written with this symbol or various variations. LaTeX provides you with a rich variety of symbols that kind of look like that so that you can introduce many different kinds of uh, partial orders if necessary. By the way, one thing I forgot to mention but which I'm mentioning now, all assignments have to be in LaTeX. Okay, if you don't know LaTeX, learn it tonight. So <clears throat> a binary relation on a set S satisfying three conditions. Just as in an equivalence relation, we're gonna require for all X, X is less than or equal to X. So of course, this doesn't capture the notion of strict inequality. It captures the notion of less than or equal to. And of course, the way it differs dramatically from an equivalence relation is we don't have symmetry. If X is less than Y, it doesn't mean that Y is less than X. But if that happens, then this can only be because X is actually equal to Y. So this is called anti-symmetry. And the third one is transitivity as before. Then there are extensions. If every two things can be compared, then we say we have a total order. We sometimes also say linear order to capture the idea that the picture of the order structure will look like a line. So of course the integers with their usual numerical less than or equal to do form in fact a total order not just a partial order and the canonical example of a partial order is you take all the subsets of some set and order them by inclusion so then of course not every pair of things can be compared because there might be some overlap but there might be also pieces that are not present in either one uh, sorry, that are present in one but not the other. So this means that the two things, neither case is one bigger than the other. Okay, so that's a typical partial order that's not total. And things like the real numbers, the rationals, the integers with numerical order are uh, total orders. Okay, now I've been saying this, it's all gone very slowly because these are things I think you know well. But now I'm going to uh, move on to perhaps a thing not all of you know, and that's called a well-founded order. well-founded order. <clears throat> okay, so just a bit of notation first. I will write X less than Y means X is less than or equal to Y, but 
x is not equal to y. So this is written as like that without the second line at the, at the bottom. And it's pronounced x is strictly less than y, strictly less than y. OK. So uh, next concept. Oops. Given a partially ordered set, and these things are sometimes affectionately called posets. So the initials PO for partially ordered set, and we'll just say poset. Okay. So given a poset, in fact, I probably write it without those uh, periods after the P and the O. So given a poset S with some order and U, a subset of S, we say U, little u in U is a minimal element. of u if for every v strictly less than u, v is not in u. So because it's only a partial order, I'm not saying little u is the smallest element in big U. There might be a bunch of distinct elements that are all incomparable with each other, but minimal means there's nobody strictly smaller than this element still inside the set u. There might be something strictly smaller than little u somewhere else outside u, but not inside u. So is this concept of minimal element clear? And a set could have no minimal elements. A set could have one minimal element, in which case we'll call it a least element. The word least implies uniqueness or there could be dozens of minimal elements or even infinitely many. So canonical example of a set without a minimal element, negative integers. There's no smallest negative integer. If you take any negative integer, there's one yet smaller than it. Okay, so this one has no minimal elements. Um, <clears throat> a set with a least element, positive integers for which of course one is the smallest, or if you want to say non-negative integers, in which case zero is the smallest. Another set that has no minimal element is the strictly positive rational numbers. So unlike the integers, strictly positive rational numbers has no least element, because no matter how small a rational number you pick, you can always take half of it. <laughs> so there you are. <clears throat> Okay, so I haven't yet defined what well-founded means. I've only defined these concepts that are a prelude to defining well-foundedness. And now I get to define well-founded. A poset is said to be well-founded <clears throat> if every non-empty subset U, uh, sorry, that was a, how do I erase, 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 erase. No, no, no. Pen, highlighter, hmm. Maybe I'll do lasso select. Um, it is next to the black pen, Professor. Oh, that's the eraser, uh-huh. Okay, what have I done with the stupid lasso? Maybe I can move it. Uh, <laughs> all right. Thank you. All right, if every non-empty subset 
has, that's a powerful word, that's an existential quantifier, has a minimal element. Okay. Maybe now's a good time for mics. Um, so examples of well-founded orders. Well, <clears throat> the non-negative integers. Something that's not well-founded, the positive rationals. Example three, pairs. of natural numbers, so with this ordering. So we'll say M N is less than or equal to M prime N prime. If M is strictly less than M prime or M is equal to M prime and N is less than or equal to N prime. So this is actually an interesting well-founded order. And uh, why is it interesting? It's because you can find two elements uh, in this order which have got infinitely many elements between them, even though it is well-founded. So let me say some basic facts, key fact. So when I use the word fact, it means I'm going to say it and not prove it. Usually that's either because it's too hard or, or not worth my time because it's too easy. But this one is of the latter kind, it's easy. And so if you're wondering why this is true, please prove it. An order is well founded. if and only if there are no infinite strictly decreasing sequences. So you can't have X1 <clears throat> strictly bigger than X2, strictly bigger than X3 going on forever. Okay, so if it's a well-founded order, it's clear that you can't have a thing like that because that would be a subset without a minimal element. It's a slightly more interesting to prove that that's a sufficient condition to guarantee well-foundedness, the absence of such chains. So this word chain, often means a sequence a, in which everything get, is ordered along that sequence. So this, um, Prakash, this yeah? someone just pointed out, uh, should it be n strictly less than n prime? No, an example? no, because it's supposed to be a partial order. Okay. Right? <clears throat> so it is possible that m is equal to m prime and n is equal to n prime, and then you say, ah, those two things are equal. <laughs> and remember, the, this is less than or equal to, so that has to be left open as a possibility. So it wasn't a typo. So indeed, I do commit typos, so thank you for pointing that out, but this particular one is not. That is what I intended. Okay, so no infinite descending chains. We use this word chain. 
either for a descending sequence or an ascending sequence. And notice that I'm saying strictly descending because obviously I can say one less than or equal to one, less than or equal to one, and so on infinitely often, but I'm talking about strictly descending. And it's very easy to see the natural numbers are not, uh, sorry, the natural, num the positive, scratch that, <laughs> the natural numbers with their usual ordering are well-founded because you cannot possibly have an infinitely descending chain. At some point, you're going to hit zero. And then you have nothing you can do about it. You are stuck there. Of course, why do we care about uh, these things in computer science? Finding well-founded orders is how you prove programs terminate. So the termination proof for a program is, aha, you see, here's this particular well-founded order. And we see that what this program is doing in its while loop or whatever is going down in this well-founded order. So it has to stop. Okay, so all our termination proofs look like that. And that's why they play a fundamental role. But they play an even more fundamental role, which is what I want to talk about today. By the way, going back to example three, uh, so we have these pairs. This is a well-founded order. I think in one of my Comp 330 assignments, I asked people to prove that this is a well-founded order. And they tend to write pages and pages of stuff. Or some people write, isn't it obvious? But anyway, it is a well-founded order. There are no infinite descending chains, but it's easy to find many, many examples of a pair of elements with infinitely many elements between them, strictly between them. And yet you cannot have an infinitely descending chain. So for example, between 117 and 25, there are infinitely many elements strictly between them, yet you can't have an infinitely descending chain. Okay, so don't be a uh, fooled by the structure of this particular order. It is well-founded, even though it is much richer in structure. So those of you who have studied uh, set theory may have heard about ordinal numbers. An, an order that is both total and well-founded okay, both total and well-founded like our natural numbers is called a well order so in fact this well order was an earlier concept and it was late in the 18th century that people started brooding about well-ordered sets. And a revolutionary thing happened right then. So as I've said, the positive integers are a well order because they're totally ordered and well-founded. And then people said, hmm, what about the real numbers? Well, obviously the real numbers are not well-ordered in the natural order that, that one gives them because you can, you, easily have infinite descending chains. Even with the rational numbers, you can have infinite descending chains. <clears throat> but uh, at least with the rational numbers, people figured out other orders, not the numerical one, but you could impose other orders that would make it well, a well-ordered set. But for the real numbers, they could not see how to do it. And people started thinking, okay, maybe not, uh, Maybe for the real numbers, it's impossible to find any kind of order that makes it well-ordered. But then they got freaked out when Ernst Zermelo proved that every set can be well-ordered. Or to be more precise, Zermelo's theorem. every set can be given a well order, not just a well-founded order, but a well order, assuming the axiom of choice. So, 
So the axiom of choice simply says that if I have a family of sets, an arbitrary family of sets, I can construct a new set by picking one element from each member of this family. Seems harmless. And people said, yeah, well, it's obviously something that's true, whatever true means exactly. And they said it should definitely be one of the basic axioms of set theory. And Zermelo and Frankel were investigating the axioms of set theory. And Zermelo said, hmm, if you assume the axiom of choice, you can prove this. So here's this intuitively obvious thing that obviously should be true, implying this thing that nobody believed. Uh, so this is what has caused a lot of problem in the world. So there are actually three important things that are all equivalent. One is the axiom of choice. This thing, which is called Zermelo's well-ordering principle. Every set can be given a well-order. And the third one is called Zorn's lemma, which says, if you have a partially ordered set such that every increasing chain has a least upper bound, then that partial order has a maximal element. And maximal is to be understood in the same sense as minimal. It may not be the largest because there might be a bunch of maximal elements that are not comparable, but there's nothing strictly larger than it in the set. Okay, so Zermelo's theorem, Zorn's lemma, and the axiom of choice all turned out to be equivalent. And um, Zorn's lemma is something people don't want to give up because it's super useful in doing all kinds of math. Axiom of choice, you have philosophical debates about. Zermelo's theorem, nobody wants to believe because there just seems to be no way of writing down the um, <clears throat> a well ordering on the real numbers. So there you are, a bit of a set theoretic digression. But now let me come to the important point. Any questions so far? How is the chat room doing? Anybody trying to break in? No, good. Okay, so I would like to discuss the principle of induction. Okay, so I'm going to informally use the word predicate, which I kind of think all of you must know what it means. So a predicate is simply a property that the sets, that the elements of a set may or may not have. So I'll use this kind of notation for a predicate and we will form subsets like this, so we will say U, so we might have some set S, and then we can define a new set by saying it's the set of elements in S that satisfy some property P. Okay, so I will sometimes talk about predicates, sometimes talk about subsets, they're really interchangeable because once I have a subset, I can say my predicate is defined as being you're in the set. <clears throat> And if I have a predicate, I can say, oh, I can define a set by saying you're in the set if you satisfy the property P. So predicates and sets, just as is convenient, one can move back and forth between using one word or the other. So for stating the principle of induction, it's useful to talk in terms of predicates. So the principle of induction says this. Supposing I have a partially ordered set, so you notice that order is a crucial part of being able to talk about induction because there's this sense of using the order to go up a ladder, right? That's how one is often explained induction in elementary classes. But we're going to vastly generalize the notion of induction that you might have learned before. So we have a partially ordered set. This is the order structure which we're hoping to climb. And the goal is to prove that everything in the set has a certain property. So here's, here goes. So we'll say S is inductive if for every predicate. So right off the bat, you see this is a second order quantifier. 
Maybe I can put a green line around it. Okay, for every predicate, this is true. This is a second order quantifier. For every P, for every X and S, for every Y strictly less than X, if P of Y holds, then P of X holds. So this statement says, for any X, it's true that if everything smaller than you satisfies the property P, then you're forced to satisfy the property P. This might or might not be true of a given predicate. But if the predicate has this property, then everybody has this property. And that's induction as you're used to it. You kind of say, hey, I prove all the small guys have some property. And then I see that this forces the next guy to have a property. And thereafter I get that, oh, then the whole set must have this property. So the crucial thing is not every order is inductive. So you were probably taught that induction is a property of the positive uh, natural numbers, of the, of the non-negative uh, integers, so of the, of the natural numbers. And you're taught, oh, there's a base case, you have to check that something holds for zero, and then you have to check that if it holds for n, it holds for n plus one, and if that's true, then immediately you know it holds for all of them. And that is the principle of induction. So this is kind of like that. One thing that seems to be missing here is, hey, what happened to the base case? But of course, if you have a minimal element, then there's nothing strictly below you, right? So this thing is automatically satisfied. So that means P of X better hold unconditionally for the minimal element. So there's your base case taken care of, built into this in fact, by the existence of minimal elements. Okay, but I've said not every order is inductive. So which orders are inductive and which are not? Anna is showing up at 11 o'clock. Well done, Anna. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> not every order is inductive. Theorem. An order is inductive if and only if it is well-founded. Right, let's prove this. So this is probably the first actual thing I'm saying that might have some novelty for you. So we're going to first prove well-foundedness implies induction. Okay, so we assume that this order is well-founded. Um, all right, so now we have to prove that induction holds. You see the form of induction is an implication. So we get to assume the antecedent of this implication. So we get to assume for all X and S, for all Y strictly less than X, if P of Y holds, then P of X must hold. So we get to assume that. Now we have to try and prove, okay, that it must follow that for all X, P of X holds. And if that's the case, then we've proven this implication, which is the principle of induction. And of course, in order to prove that for all X, P of X holds, we have to somehow exploit well-foundedness. So assume, 
you um oh sorry i don't want to call it you because i want to call it yeah. assume there's a set v which is defined to be the set of <clears throat> uh, elements of s such that they don't satisfy p okay well our goal is to show that this set is actually empty which is the same thing as saying that hey everybody satisfies p all right how do we show this is empty well we assume that this set is not empty so it has a minimal element which we can call v0 cool <clears throat> so now for all y strictly less than v0 y is not in v yes that's what it means to say v0 is a minimal element if anything is strictly smaller than you then, then v0 it can't be in the set b otherwise v0 would not be a minimal element but what does this mean p of y holds because v with set capital v is precisely the guys who don't satisfy p so if you're not in that set that means you must be satisfying p so all these things strictly less than v0 satisfy p but look at what our assumption told us it says hey if everything for any element in particular v0 if everything strictly smaller than you satisfies p then this element itself must satisfy p but the assumption then implies p of v0 yeah uh shouldn't it be y not in v because correct <laughs> thank you <clears throat> right <clears throat> why not in v otherwise uh v0 would not be minimal thank you so but the assu uh, assumption then forces p of v0 but this is a contradiction because v0 is chosen from this set of things that don't satisfy p so that contradiction tells us there can't be such a thing like v0 but every set is supposed to have a minimal element so the only way it can fail to have a minimal element is being empty so v is the empty set i.e for all x p of x so voila we have proved the principle of induction by assuming well-foundedness so now we're going to do the reverse direction induction implies well-foundedness okay honestly i don't know if these things have constructive proofs i'm not even 100 percent sure if they are constructively valid stefan you have any idea is it constructively true the equivalence of well-foundedness and induction no answer okay uh, anyway here we are doing classical math uh, so i want to prove that induction implies well-foundedness so we're going to do this again by contradiction so assume u subset of s has no minimal element okay and of course we're assuming that the set s with this partial order on it is uh, an inductive set so the principle of induction is assumed to hold we're going to show that this forces it to be well-founded 
So we're taking a set which has no minimal element and now we're going to try and derive a contradiction. So the contradiction will tell you in the end there can't be sets like that, which is basically saying S is well-founded. Okay, so we're going to define a predicate P. It's defined to be X is not in U. Okay, clear? Okay, so how does the argument proceed? So we've got this predicate that says X is not in U. Now for all X, it is true that if all the Y's strictly less than X satisfy P, then X has to satisfy P. Why is that true? Because if X did not satisfy P, X would be a minimal element, right? Because then X would be in U and everything strictly smaller than X is not in U. So that would make, say, aha, well, this X is a minimal element of U, but we just said U has no minimal elements. So this must be the case. <clears throat> All right. But now, the induction principle, which says, well, if you've got this situation, then it follows that this holds. everything satisfies P. But what does it mean to say everything satisfies P? That means nothing is in U. <laughs> so U is the empty set. And hence S is well founded. So this is a super important connection because it vastly extends the notion of induction from just the integers to all kinds of other structures. So if you take trees with tree embeddings, you can see that that's a well-founded order. So you can do induction on tree structures. You take terms defined by structural recursion. That means they have to be well-founded. <clears throat> and from that, it follows that you can do induction called structural induction on terms of a language. Um, so many, many things follow from this. So this is due to a famous mathematician called Emmy Neuter. Who was the greatest mathematical physicist uh, ever. <clears throat> um, greatest mathematical physicist ever. I think that's a fair statement. Uh, amongst other things, apart from proving the principle of well-founded induction, which she did in the context of ring theory as a kind of a side lemma. She introduced this concept of Noetherian rings. She also invented algebra three, basically. <laughs> so everything you've learned in algebra three basically came from her. And amongst other things, she also gave the crucial idea behind modern algebraic topology because people were used to looking at numerical invariants of manifolds. And she said, these are not just numbers coming from so somewhere or the other, these numbers probably represent groups and they're probably the number of generators of a group. So then they started saying, aha, what are these groups she's talking about in the invented homology? So uh, she made many, many fundamental contributions to math and to mathematical physics. Okay. Let's give an example of a set that is not well founded. So let's look at the set of all strings over the two letter alphabet. So this consists of the empty string, the very short strings A and B, A, 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 B, and so on. And then we order them lexicographically, that means dictionary order, right? So AAA become, comes before AB. So if you look at lexicographic ordering, 
this is not well founded because you can have a chain a strictly greater than um, <clears throat> do I remember how the chain goes? A is um, I don't remember exactly what the chain is, but under lexical, whoops, under lexicographic ordering. This is not well founded. Okay, it's now 11.33. We're gonna take a short break, maybe 15 minutes. Uh, you can turn on your mics and ask me questions. And we will resume at quarter to 12. I'm going to grid view. We can just have an idle chat. You can ask me about the weather, which is cold and gray. And I can check my email. This is rubbish. That is more rubbish. This is nonsense. I had a small question about the proof. Yeah. Uh, you assume that U has no minimal element, right? Yeah. But uh, is it possible that U has a minimal element, but is not a partial order? Should you prove that as well? I'm trying to deconstruct your question. What do you mean by is not a partial order? The point was to do a, a quiet proof for a second question. and let me finish. Oh, so, sorry. Partial order is an adjective applied to the whole set. So what do you mean by saying an element is not a partial order? Okay, okay, I see what you mean. Clarify my question, yeah. Good. Who are you? I couldn't see which uh, window lit up. Uh, Dragos. Sorry? Dragos. Dragos. So was this proof more or less clear to everyone? Yeah. Good. I'm just getting some water. Give me this. So this thing is showing how many participants? Can you tell me how many participants there are? Uh, 35. 35, that includes me, I guess, so 34. And are there any of you who are not registered? I'm not registered. Can you, let me try, let me see if I can fire up the chat. How do I get? This thing goes into such a chat. Okay, there we go. Does a well-founded poster need at least one or could it have infinitely many minimal elements? Short answer is infinitely many, Hannah, Hannah Lita. Uh, <clears throat> Kleenex algebras. Talise Wang wants to know the final is oral, how it works. We'll, we, we, uh, well, we're not allowed to strap you to the chair, so you can sit comfortably in a chair and answer my questions. That's how it works. <clears throat> and it will take 15 minutes, plenty of time to find out how, what you really know. I'm very interested in all these people who produce absolutely amazingly clear and accurate answers that seem to exactly match what I can also find on the web. So 15 minutes will convince me whether you really knew it or whether you just copied it blindly. 
sorry, could you go over your argument for um, the for all x, um, for all y less than x, p of y implies p of x again? Sorry, which part of the argument? Uh, the um, Is this uh, the induction implies well-foundedness or the other way around? Uh, yeah, induction implies well-foundedness that uh, if x is in u, then like, then it's inductive, basically. Like the... Um, no, excuse me. I want to stop this right now. So people use this pronoun it in a manner that absolutely infuriates me and drives me bananas. And you just did that. Sorry. Yes, you should be sorry. <laughs> you said it is inductive. What the fuck is inductive? It's a property that applies to the whole set, not to an element. So you can't tell me an element is inductive or not inductive. Okay, I, I'm the the line for all x mm -hmm. for all y less than x p of y yes. implies p of x. Um, right. You you went over an argument there, but I didn't quite catch that. Okay, so I can go over the argument. So yes, x is <clears throat> um, suppose. Uh, you look, you're looking at a particular X, right? So just fix attention on, a, on an X, okay? And suppose it happens that everything strictly less than that X satisfies P. What does that mean? It means that all those Ys are not in U. Agree? Because satisfying yeah, P yeah. means you're not in U. So every Y is every y strictly less than x is not in u. If x is in u, then x is a minimal element. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. But, but, with, but then we said the set u was chosen not to have any, any minimal elements. So it can't be like that. It can't you can't have a thing that's in u and is minimal because that would violate the definition of what u is supposed to be. So that means x better not be in u. But that's exactly the same thing as saying p of x. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. And then, of course, from now, you can apply in. Okay. Thank you. Good. This is uh, a complicated argument, but the logic is, is uh, <laughs> it's easy to forget it. <clears throat> or to lose, to lose track of it. So it, it makes sense. But please type check your questions. And by type check, I mean, if you say, I want to know if this thing has this property, then you have to check that the property in question actually applies to the type of thing which you're asking. Elements are not well-ordered. Elements are just elements. Sets with an order structure are well-ordered. A set may have a minimal element or not. An individual element cannot be out of a vacuum. We can, can you say, hey, is this element minimal? Well, that doesn't mean anything. Uh, hello. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about the same statement. Uh, I also didn't understand it at first. And the way I understood it, I wanted to know if it's valid. So I just thought that since X for the- a second. What do you mean by it is valid? Your understand your way of understanding is valid, or, or what? yes, yeah, my way of understanding it. Okay. Uh, so uh, for the same statement, so if we take x in u, mm -hmm. then by definition, p of x is ne is never true. Mm -hmm. There's and no so yeah, and so the the statement of implication is always true because. Uh, both sides are always false, kind of thing. Uh, no, that is definitely not a valid way of understanding it. So for, a, for an implication to be true, you either want the antecedent to be true or the, con uh, sorry, the antecedent to be false or the consequent to be true. You've just argued that the right. antecedent is, is uh, is false, that doesn't mean anything at all. Right, but if the, 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 the consequence is also always false, then the statement is always true. Yes, but we don't, right? we don't know that the consequence is false a priori. 
Okay. We don't know a priori that for all x, p of x. Uh, well, isn't it, are we, are we, okay, because we're not assuming that x is in u. I guess that's why. Yeah, you can phrase it like that if you want. X is in use, okay. so hence automatically not P of X. And then you better convince me that uh, the right-hand side is true. Uh, sorry, that okay. the right-hand side is also false. But that's a twisted and convoluted way, right? Mine was yes. a direct forward argument. Indeed. So I think uh, just because it is valid in a twisted and convoluted way doesn't make it a good argument. Okay, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I had a question about um, the the part of the proof. Uh, well, the from well founded implies inductive. Well founded implies inductive. Okay. And uh, it's the the first line right after it says assume for all x and s. Uh, well, that whole logical statement. Yeah. Uh, I'm not. Uh, why are we assuming that? I just I didn't catch that argument. Because if you look at what the principle of induction says, it says that whole statement, okay. this whole statement implies for all x, p of x. So how do you prove implications? How do you prove capital P implies capital Q? You get to assume capital P, and then you mm. try to prove capital Q. So we get to assume all this, and then we get to try and prove this. That's, that's what a proof of an implication is. Okay, thank you. So I'm hoping this particular proof is not that important. I mean, the result is important, but it's a, it is a proof and it's giving you a sense of the kind of logical arguments that I expect you to be able to take in your stride. So, <clears throat> When I prove P implies Q in the future, I don't want you to say, what gets you, how do you get to assume P? Well, that's the damn definition of a proof of an implication. <clears throat> you prove P implies Q by assuming P. I don't have to justify wh why P might be true independently. That's what implication means. If P is true, then Q is true. <clears throat> um, I have a, a last question before we begin again. Yeah. Um, it's changing topics back to the beginning on binary relations. Yes. Um, I mean, it seems obvious, but I, I don't know if I would be able to prove it that if we have a binary relation, we would have the existence of one where if we have X less than or equal to Y, we could define another one where Y is less than or equal to X. Like, so if you, if you have a partial order, yeah. then you're claiming that the, yeah, so I'm not sure what are you claim, what are you claiming? So I, I think that. So just one second, Maria, you, yes. you, you're saying binary relation, but of course, binary relation is a very generic concept of which these two are special cases. So I think you're talking about partial orders and not generic binary relations. Is that correct? Um, I think so. Okay. What I what I want to to portray it's like okay we have a less than or equal there yes. should be a greater than or equal as well yes certainly there is automatically okay and that's that's for just a converse or... that's just a converse of of this yes and you could have axiomatized it with greater than or equal to it would look very similar okay if x is greater than or equal to y and y is greater than or equal to z then x is greater than or equal to z blah 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 so it's it's just a matter of taste. I don't even bother to make it a separate definition because it's so immediate. Yeah, okay. But the thing I thought you were trying to say is not true, but of course, maybe this is not at all what you were trying to say and I just imagined it. <laughs> <laughs> but supposing I have a partial order, X less than or equal to Y, and then I say, I'm going to define a new uh, binary relation. X is not less than or equal to Y. There's absolutely no reason why that thing has to be a partial order. Yeah, I was not trying to say that. Good, good. So it was only my, you know, fevered imagination. <laughs> okay. 
So what are we going to do now? Automata theory. Okay. Whoops. Yeah. Huh. So this is one note. I'm just hoping that all these pages are correctly being uh, correctly being stored and I can upload them one day. Yes, I'm beginning to realize what a huge luxury it was to just walk into a classroom and write on the board <laughs> and see human beings in front of me. Anyway, uh, here we go. <clears throat> All right, now things are getting exciting. I have to take off my jacket. Oh God, my belly is so big, jeez. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> and my head is getting hot. Right. <clears throat> Rosie, you're happy being the monitor? Um, uh, yeah, I can keep on monitoring. Oh, or is it a big distraction? Maybe we should appoint somebody else. Uh, I mean, sure, <laughs> if someone else wants to monitor. <laughs> okay, Marcel, where are you? Are you there? All right, you're the monitor, so you have to turn on your mic. Okay, sure. Keep an eye on the chat room. And if somebody's asking a question, you should, you should um, interrupt me. Okay, got it. Great. So, so that was all very mathy, elementary, but still mathematical. Now I want to... Uh, introduce a bit of uh, more computer science-y stuff. Yes, so I'm, I'm, I'm also doing these lectures kind of winging it, so I don't have notes and um, my notes here say, now teach them strings. <laughs> so, uh, I'm hoping I remember all the relevant things. <clears throat> okay, so this is lecture one, part two. Oh, by the way, is Stefan still there? Stefan, are you still there? Uh, he is, Stefan is there. Uh, uh, okay. Right, do you happen to know, Stefan, the answer to my question about constructively proving well-foundedness equivalent to induction? Okay, he'll tell me some time. Right, so <clears throat> the first thing I'm going to do. A uh, professor, he says he thinks it's false in constructive math. Oh, I see. Is that true? What the devil did the chat room go again? Chat. Yeah, he's working on a proof. I think it's false in concern. I started writing a proof, it's almost complete. Okay, well, I got the right guy. Very good. So <clears throat> now we're going to move to the fundamental question, what is computation? And uh, <laughs> this will take basically two thirds of the semester to answer. So, <clears throat> so don't expect an instant answer right now, but clearly one of the key ideas is processing symbols. So we're going to, in introduce some of the basic algebra need, needed to discuss this act of symbolic manipulation. So there's going to be a string of definitions. It's always a bit boring when you say this is this is this is this. So I'll try to give some uh, interesting examples along the way. Uh, and why is my arrow in the middle of the screen? Okay, right. So. we're going to introduce something called an alphabet. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, professor, yeah. I think Justine dis uh, disconnected and she wanted to be let back in. Oh, and she needs my, she needs yeah. Justine wants to be let in again. How did you know? Uh, Rosie said. And how did you know Rosie? Oh, I, she messaged me. Okay, because I didn't see a notification. Otherwise I would have let her in. Anyway, all right, fine. A finite set is called an alphabet. Okay, so what are typical examples of alphabets? Okay, uh, another example of an alphabet, a popular one is the symbol zero and one. You can have an alphabet with five letters in it and so on. So that's an alphabet. We're going to use this notation sigma star to be the set of finite sequences. So this word finite seems to cause lot, cause lots of people to have conniption fits. Um, <clears throat> so a finite sequence is a finite ordered collection of symbols drawn from the alphabet sigma. The number of these uh, finite sequences is infinite, even when sigma is finite, even when sigma is one letter. <clears throat> so of course the elements of the alphabet are called letters. So if sigma is AB, then sigma star consists of, well, one possible word that you can have, oh, so we use these things, we call these things words. So we had letters, now we're constructing words. So <clears throat> um, one word that you can construct is by taking no symbols. So this is called the empty word. Now the trouble is, the empty word should, strictly speaking, be represented by, by, by nothing. But then if I try to point at an empty thing on the board and say, there's the empty word, it gets very confusing. So we actually introduce a symbol for the empty word. If sigma is just a one letter alphabet with only A in it, then it's epsilon, A, 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 and so on, in nice correspondence with the natural numbers. But here you see we have a bit more structure than the natural numbers. Professor? Yeah? I don't know if you saw it, but um, I think Stefan has proved um, that it's not constructible because it implies excluded middle. Fantastic. So he can uh, email me the proof. <clears throat> but I don't want to suddenly inspect this proof in the middle of this class. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating though it must be. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I kind of thought it, it couldn't be uh, constructively true. Okay, cool. So let's explore a bit of algebra associated with these things. So finally, any subset of sigma star is called a language. So that's it. How do I describe a language? Aha, well, that's the interesting question. So I can give ad hoc ways. I can tell you, oh, I have this language in which all the words have equal numbers of A's and B's. So that's a perfectly valid mathematical description in which I kind of used semi-mathematical words to describe it. But we would like to explore systematic ways of describing languages. We will explore ways of describing a language. And algorithms for testing whether a word belongs to a language.
and in fact, this will give us a handle on what it means to be able to compute. So we're going to describe, in some sense, the computational difficulty of testing whether a word belongs to a particular language. So we're going to have different ways of describing languages. So we're going to have formalisms that will become increasingly rich and hence increasingly difficult to test whether a word is in the language or not. And we're going to introduce these formalisms systematically instead of just giving ad hoc definitions. So the very first class of words, of, sorry, of languages that we're going to talk about are called regular languages. And they are going to be recognized by very simple algorithms called finite state machines. So that's where we're going today. We're going to cover the theory of deterministic finite automata. That's what they're called. And so there are two counterparts to this, a way of describing languages and a way of testing whether a given word belongs to that language. And we're going to explore the algebra that arises out of these simple ideas. So first, some pure baby algebra. A monoid. is a set S with a binary operation usually written with a dot and a unit E such that for all X, Y, Z in the set x dot y dot z equals x dot y dot z and two for all x in s x dot e equals e dot x equals x that's what it means to call this special element e a unit so every monoid has to have the special element so notice axioms that I have not written. So one axiom that I have not written is x y x dot y equals y dot x. Okay, that's not part of the definition of a monoid. If then we get a special kind of monoid called a commutative monoid. So what's an example of a commutative monoid? The natural numbers, zero and up with ordinary addition. So you notice that I don't have an operation like inverse. I don't have an operation like inverse. So the natural numbers, including zero, do form a monoid and I'm not required to have an inverse. If I also have an inverse operation, then I get a very, very special kind of monoid called a group. But monoids are much more general than groups. So if I look at all the integers, the positive and negative, with addition as the operation and zero as the unit, that's a group. In fact, that's an, a commutative group, also called an abelian group. But if I just look at the zero and up, well, that's certainly not a group because I don't have inverses. Those would be the negative integers which I've just excluded, but I still have a binary associative commutative operation. So I have a commutative monoid, okay? So many things that you think are, should be groups are actually not because they don't have proper inverses, um, <clears throat> but they're at least monoids. So an important monoid for us is sigma star, with concatenation
and epsilon is a monoid. It is not commutative. Okay, and the operation is just, you take the two words and place them next to each other and view them as one word. So A, A, B dot B, A is simply A, A, B, B, A. Okay, dot just means take the two words, glue them together. Obviously, if I glue the empty word on either side, it makes no difference because I've glued nothing. So it is a monoid, but there's no inverse. It's not, that's absolutely not a group. There's no such thing as, you know, a inverse that you can put there and cancel out the A. But it does have a special property. A special property for all X, Y, Z. If X, Z, X, Y equals X, Z, then Y equals Z. So even though we don't have inverses, we can still somehow cancel out things. So this is called a cancellative monoid. And sigma star is indeed a cancellative monoid with these operations, which is kind of a funky thing because somehow, even though it's not, it is not a group, there certainly doesn't, aren't inverse elements. Uh, it is nevertheless a cancellative monoid. Okay, so this structure, just this ability to take strings and glue them together already gives us an algebra called a monoid and this monoid concept, which tends to be not very much talked about in math department algebra courses. They tend to say, yeah, there's monoids, but then monoids are boring, we're gonna do groups. And then they spend two groups for like two and a half years, uh, which is fine because groups are great things. I love groups, <laughs> but, monoids are not entirely to be ignored. Okay, so this set sigma star with the concatenation operation and the empty string forms a cancellative monoid. It has another very interesting property, which I think is on your first assignment. I'm pretty sure it is. So suppose So of course, sigma star is one example of a monoid, but there are many, many monoids out there. You know, we can cook them all up with matrices and this and that. You can make many, many monoids. Suppose M is any, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. I forgot to tell you one super important concept first. Definition. If M1, and M2 are monoids, and H, a function from M1 to M2 satisfies H of X dot Y equals H of X dot H of Y, and H of epsilon equals, sorry, not epsilon, that's E. H of E equals, let me specify. Just to make sure, H of E1 equals E2. So E1 is the identity element for the monoid M1. E2 is the identity element for the monoid M2. So if H maps the identity to the identity and preserves multiplication, then we'll say H is a homomorphism. Okay, this is a very standard notion in algebra. You have some kind of set with some kind of algebraic structure on it. A homomorphism is a map that preserves that algebraic structure. Okay, so now special property of sigma star. Suppose, suppose M 
is any monoid. And suppose F from sigma to M is any function. any function. So remember, I said just function, not homomorphism, because sigma is not a monoid. Sigma star is a monoid, but sigma is just a set. So I've got any old, any old function. No restrictions, because there's nothing to restrict. Sigma is a completely unstructured set. So supposing I take any old function like that, then there exists a unique homomorphism which we will call F star going from sigma star to M. So now I'm saying homomorphism. So from F I can construct a unique homomorphism from sigma star to M such that if I look at sigma such that this diagram commutes, which means F equals F star circle eta, where eta of A is A for all A in sigma. So this thing just says, look, this set of strings, of course, includes the one letter strings. Also includes many other things, the two letter strings, the three letter strings, and so on. But every letter can be included and thought of as a short word. So this map eta just says, regard sigma as a subset of sigma star. And now it says, if I do that, and then I follow this homomorphism, it'll tell me exactly what F did. So it's respecting my original completely unstructured map, but I have extended it in such a way that instead of just being defined on sigma, it's defined on all of sigma star in such a way that it actually is homomorphic. And furthermore, it's unique. There's only one way of doing this. Okay, so this is a very, very special property of sigma star. It's not true if I take any old monoid and I try to say, oh, there's some kind of map from the underlying set, blah, 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 that I can extend it in this way. No, this is a very, very, very special property of sigma star. So this is called a universal property. and sigma star is called the free monoid generated by sigma. Okay, so this is a universal property of sigma star. It's absolutely not true that any old monoid that you pick up has anything resembling a property like this. This is extremely special. So I wanted to emphasize how special sigma star is. I gave you one very familiar example of a commutative monoid. I gave you one perhaps new to you example of the monoid of strings. I want to give you a third example, which again you're familiar with, but you probably never thought of it as a monoid. For example, let S be any set and let S arrow S be the set of functions from S to itself. Yeah? 
then with composition as the operation, and the identity function as the unit, we get a monoid. And again, this is a good example of a monoid that's not a group because not every function can be inverted. If I said, ah, I'm only looking at bijections, that would be a group. <clears throat> but since I'm allowing any old function, well, I can certainly compose them, but I can't invert them. And this is not even a cancellative monoid. But this is also a super important monoid for us. Okay, maybe I'll do a small pause for questions. Marcel, anybody asking anything in exciting? Uh, no. Uh, mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask, does the function have to be surjective? No. Oh. Somebody trying to get in? Marley, who's Marley? Anybody know who Marley is? Never heard of him. Yeah. What? You know, somebody knows who Marley is? I could know. I'm not sure if it's the Marley I know. And who is he? That's Anna, I guess. Yes. Should I, should I admit him or should I remove him? Yeah, you can let. Okay. Saved by Anna. <clears throat> uh, all right. Now I'm going to define something that looks... So I was doing all this algebra and you're probably wondering what the hell does this have to do with computer science? Now I'm going to define something that looks very computery and you probably will ask what the hell does this have to do with algebra? But the two are closely related in fact. So I'm finally getting to define something of interest and uh, from a practical point of view. A finite, uh, a deterministic Ministic finite automaton. So, people who know me know that I'm a neurotic jerk, so I can't stand it when people write automata for the singular. Automata is the plural. So it's one automaton, 17 automata, okay? <clears throat> so under no circumstances say automatas because that'll cause my CPU to blow. So uh, <clears throat> finite automaton, a deterministic finite automaton, which we will affectionately call a DFA. These things are also called deterministic finite state machines. But you know, these are very abstract kind of machines. So I prefer the word automaton. A deterministic finite automaton is, a, I guess, five tuple. This is a barbarism. One should say quintuple, but anyway, five tuple. So we'll use the letter A for the automaton. So there's a set S, there's a little element S0 in S, there's a function delta of type, ah, damn. There is a set sigma, there is a function delta of type S cross sigma to S, and a set F. And maybe I can stick it in here. This is actually in S. Yep. So it is 
these five things. So this, this is a very abstract definition. What on earth does it mean? <clears throat> so, um, a deterministic finite automaton is a gadget that reads words words from sigma star okay and moves from state to state that's the intuitive picture so s is called the set of states s0 is called the start state Sigma is called the alphabet. Delta is called the transition function. And F is called the set of accepting states. So A reads a word from sigma star and either accepts it or rejects it. Okay. So before I formalize how it accepts and rejects, I think this is a very good time to look at an example. So we're going to look at a bunch of examples of finite automata because uh, other than that, because before we look at examples, it just looks like a very dry, sterile definition with a bunch of Greek letters, well, at least two Greek letters. So one can draw a nice pictorial representation of automata which are very easy to draw, uh, not so easy to typeset in LaTeX. <laughs> so when I ask you to draw automata, either you can learn how to do it in LaTeX or you can draw it by hand and scan it and, and convert it to PDF. Um, so let's, uh, let's see, what's a good example of an automaton? Um, Okay, so I'm going to take the alphabet to be AB. I'm going to draw an automaton. So the way we draw an automaton, the elements of the set S are depicted as circles. Okay, the special state where we start, we have a little arrow like this indicating this is the start state. So you notice there's exactly one from the definition. There's a unique start state. Then we draw arrows like this. Okay, and what these arrows tell you, so then these things can have names. So we put S0 there, maybe this one is called S1. And what these arrows are uh, depicting is that function delta, which tells you how does the machine change state as it reads a letter. So this thing says, basically delta S0 of A equals S1. Delta S0 of B equals S0 itself. Okay. So for every state, I have to tell you where it goes. Okay, so I'm not gonna write down this whole table because the whole point of drawing this picture is to not write down this table. 
but to show you the transition function of the automaton in a visually appealing way. So let's just track what this thing does. So supposing, for example, we're reading the word A, B, B, A, B, A, B, B. So we start from here and we start from here, we read the A, we go there. We read the B, we go there. We read another B, we stay there. We read the A, we come back here. We read the B, we go here again. We read the A, we come back here. We read the B, we go there again. We read another B, we stay there. So is it clear how to think about the operation of this machine? Right, it's just reading a letter by letter, always going left to right. Never saying, oh yeah, I want to see that last letter again. No, <laughs> you don't get to see the last letter again. You go one step at a time, reading one letter, making exactly one change. Why is it called deterministic? Because if you're in a state and you read a letter, it's unambiguous where you go next. You have no choice in this matter, okay? And finally, what is the point of all these things? At the end, you finish reading the word and then you decide, ah, this is a good word. Let's say, for example, for us, this is going to be a good, good word. And how do we indicate that it's a good word? We say, you end up in one of these accepting states, F. So I have to show you the accepting states and we indicate that with a double circle. Double circle. So you see, this is an example of a word that's read and processed by this machine and it is accepted. So what is this machine? It's looking at words and saying, yes, no, yes, no. In fact, what it's doing is it is defining a language. It is telling you a set of words that it accepts. That set of words is called the language of the machine. So I have to formalize all this in a bit, but I hope the intuitions are clear. Yeah, everybody okay with this concept of how the machine reads a word? So let's look at a word. Uh, Let's say B, B, A, A, B. So here we are. We start here. We read a B, so we stay there. We read another B, we still stay there. Then we see an A, so we jump here. Then we see another A, we jump here. And then we see another B and we stay here. And then we see this is not an accept state. So this word is rejected. Okay, so can anyone tell me what is this machine doing? What words is it accepting and what words is it rejecting? checking the chat. Omar says, rejecting words with AA, very good. So you can see that this is somehow a dead state. Once you're here, there is no way out. So you know that once you're here, you're screwed. 
There's no way that the word is going to be accepted. And what was the signal that got you here? AA. So in fact, this is the machine that accepts a word if and only if every A is immediately followed by a B. Now the word doesn't, uh, and furthermore, the word has to have at least one A in it. Because if you just read Bs, then you're here, which is just the start state, it's not an accept state. Okay, so here's an example of a machine and a language that it recognizes. Okay, so now formalizing acceptance. Okay, very good. So let's go on. I'm going to define a new function, delta star. And this is a map from sigma star uh, cross S to S. Hmm, maybe I want to define this slightly opposite way. Yeah, S cross sigma star to S. So you, you remember what delta did. It says, if you're in the state and you read this letter, move to this other state. But delta star is saying, if you're in the state and you see this whole word, where will you end up? So we have to define that by induction on the length of the word sigma star. So by induction on length of W in sigma star. Okay, so we'll use this notation with the two vertical lines means length of W. So delta star in any state if you read the empty string, you stay there. You didn't read anything, why are you going anywhere? <clears throat> and then delta star S with um, W dot A. So there's your inductive definition for you. This is Okay, so this says, well, you're asking me, where does the machine end up if it starts in state S and reads the word W followed by A? Well, from my inductive induction, I'm supposed to know where W by itself takes it. And then after that, just an ordinary transition by delta takes you to the next state. So remember how to type check this. This guy belongs to S. That's indeed a letter of the alphabet. And of course, this is for all A in sigma. <clears throat> okay, so is this definition clear? What, how delta star works? So it tells you basically, not just where you go after one step, but where you go after reading a whole word. So now we're going to define the language of an automaton. L of A is the set of words in sigma star such that if I look at delta star from the start state, not from any old state, but from the start state, and I read the whole word and I see where I end up, I have to end up in one of my designated final states. So this is called the language accepted by or recognized by. So sometimes we call these things language recognizers. And now very important concept. A language recognized by a DFA 
is called a regular language. So the crucial concept here is these are languages that are so simple that the machine or the algorithm to recognize them requires only finite memory, constant memory independent of the size of the input. Okay, other languages may require more memory, <clears throat> might require memory that scales with the size of the input, for example. So, uh, <clears throat> so this is the first crude attempt to limit the computational power of something. Finite state machines, which is an alternative name for deterministic finite automata, are not very powerful. There's all kinds of things they can't recognize. However, there's all kinds of things they can recognize. And what's great about them is that they have a nice algebraic structure. There's a whole algebra of regular languages to go with the algebra of strings. <clears throat> and so we will be studying this algebra. It's what's called Claney algebra. Um, <clears throat> and almost everything you want to know about regular languages is actually decidable. And if you try to, as you try to, so what will happen throughout this term is we'll say, we're going to study a way of specifying languages. We're going to study algorithms for recognizing them. Then we're going to study ways of proving that certain languages cannot be recognized. Then we'll enrich the class of languages and the complexity of the machines that are there to recognize them and so on until we get to the most powerful uh, machines which are called iPhones. No, they're called Turing machines. <clears throat> okay, so Turing machines of course will come late in the term, but this is the first simplest, most basic machine. So the rest of the class is just examples of these machines once you understood the concept of recognition. So I'm going to show you a machine. I'm going to show you a machine and ask you, what do you think it does? So there are many assignments assignment questions about design a machine to do this, design a machine to do that, design a machi machine to recognize languages with this and that description. <clears throat> right, okay. So I'm going to take as my alphabet zero and one. Yeah, zero and one, that's it. Not very different from A and B, but just for fun, I'm using zero and one. And here's the machine. It has a start state. I'm not going to bother to give the names to the start states because the picture will tell you the structure of the machine. So this machine has three states. And if I read a zero, I stay in my start state. If I read a one, I go here. Yeah, so I've completely described what delta does to the first state on either of the letters. Here, if I read a zero, I go there. And if I read a one, I go back here. Here, if I read a zero, I go here. And if I read a one, I go there. And this guy is also my accept state. 
So let's see some example of strings that it recognizes. So here's the language of this automaton. I'm obviously not showing you all the words because it accepts infinitely many words. <clears throat> um, zero. Also epsilon, which I should have said first. Does it accept one? No, because it takes you there, which is not an accept state. So one, zero, zero, one. That's accepted, right? One, zero, zero, one. Zero, zero, one, one. Also one, one, zero, zero. One, zero, one, zero, one. So these are, of course, examples that it accepts. What kind of thing does it not accept? Well, one, zero, one, definitely not accepted. So it's actually a simple, nice looking, quite symmetrically designed machine. What is it doing? Can anyone give me an informal description of the language that this guy is recognizing? Um, divisibility by three. Yes, very good, wouldn't you? Um, can you explain why? So yeah. Um, I think to uh, I think to best understand it, we just need to like trace out what's happening. So initially, we start. Um, each state would correspond to um, one state mod three, would correspond to the remainder. Exactly. So each state corresponds to the remainder mod three. So when you're in the start state, you're saying, if I'm reading this as a binary number from left to right, this number has remainder zero mod three. If I'm in this state, the remainder is one mod three. And if I'm in this state, the remainder is two mod three. So if you look at what the transitions are saying, well, if the remainder is zero, and then I add another zero at the end of a binary number, what is it doing? It's doubling the number. But twice zero is zero, so I stay there. Here, I'm doubling the number, so mod three, that's still zero, and adding one. So remainder is now one. What happens if I'm here? Then if I see a zero, I'm doubling it, so remainder one becomes remainder two. If I'm doubling it and adding one, remainder one becomes remainder two plus one, remainder three, which is back to zero. And same for this. So that's extremely good and extremely fast. It took me longer than that to uh, recognize this machine. So this gives an important lesson. When you're designing machines, the states should have some purpose. You can't just be drawing random circles and, and lines and hoping that you <laughs> end up with the design. You have to think, what is being encoded by being in this state? Okay, so there'll be plenty of uh, homework questions saying, design a machine that does this, design a machine that does that. So now that I've described this, you can easily see if I want to say, accept the binary strings that have remainder two and divided by five, it's easy to do along the same lines. Just as here, you have five states, to keep track of the remainder mod five, you can work out the transitions, you'll know which one to designate with the accept state, and there you go. So any one of those things, it gets more and more tedious as the thing gets bigger, but <clears throat> here is a very nice machine that's actually got some non-trivial purpose. So this shows you divisibility by three. Yeah, I can check that with a finite state machine. So even though these are wimpy little machines with finite memory, they can still do this. Okay. Supposing we say, and then we say the language of the automaton is the set W such that W has an equal number of 
A's and P's. How would we design a machine to do that? Any ideas? Yeah, just, just keep going. Keep going what? Uh, you keep going to the right with one letter and then you keep going back with the other letter once you reach the, the last state. Let me see if I understand what you're saying. So you're saying if you see an A go like this. No, it, it won't work, it won't work. <laughs> yes, good catch. So why won't it work? Your, what, it, it, it could start with B2. <laughs> let, let's try your plan anyway. I, I did like to, I thought it was a nice idea. Uh, um, professor, professor, you might need unbounded memory which cannot be achieved with a regular, with an automaton of this nature. Very good. So you see this whole idea has been spiked before we got it off the ground. Okay. <laughs> so it's clear, in fact, if you think about it, I've said it has an equal number of A's and B's. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so if I count the number of A's, then I have to count off the number of Bs and check that those are equal. But I may see all the A's first, so I have to count them all. And then I have no limit on how big my machine is because it could be any number of A's. So you cannot do this with finite memory. So counting is not possible. No DFA can do this. And on Thursday, we will study a theorem called the pumping lemma. And the pumping lemma is a characterization of languages that cannot be recognized by finite state machines or, or DFAs. And using the pumping lemma, we'll be able to look at this language and that language and say, that's possible, that's not possible. Well, to prove that it's possible, you construct a machine. <laughs> to prove that it's not possible, you use the pumping lemma. This was kind of an intuitive argument but a very valid one and, and indeed the pumping lemma just form, formalizes this intuition about finite memory. But this shows you the limitations of finite memory. Finite memory can do lots of things, but it can't do all kinds of very simple things. So parenthesis matching can't do it with a finite state machine. And parenthesis matching of course is an important part of any compiler, right? You have all these brackets and things and you have to match things to see that they're matched up. HTML is filled with pairs of matching tags. None of this can be done with a finite state machine. It will require the next step, which is in our second module, which I re realized I didn't talk about, and that will be so-called context-free languages. Uh, and what's happening on the chat? Would the picture resemble a fractal? What do you mean, Maria? Um. <clears throat> I'm just thinking of when in Algebra 3 we um, looked at the, was it the Colvin graph? Um, I don't remember, for free groups. For, for example, for the free group um, generated by two letters, we would have like kind of a tree where it would just fractal. I don't know. It could be like a line, but infinite, so it wouldn't be. For this one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking, yeah, we don't have inverses here. So. Yes. Maria, you have to resist group theory intuition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because, you, you know, there's a reason why people study groups, because they have incredible, amazing properties. Yeah, I've got, I have my mind polluted by algebra. No, it's not polluted. It's not polluted. It's, it's glorified and blessed by algebra. But <laughs> the point is, we are in a much simpler world where many, many beautiful things, like the free group on two generators, 
is an amazing thing, right? It's just one of the most spectacular mathematical objects you can come across. It's the reason behind all those uh, Van Aktarsky paradoxes and things. But here, well, the free monoid on two generators is this sigma star for AB. So as you can see, not a very dramatic structure. Yeah. But let's get on to recognition by monoids. Okay, so, so um, <clears throat> let M be a finite monoid. I emphasize finite. Let F be a finite, well, obviously it's finite because <laughs> it's a subset of M. All right? Let H from sigma star to M be a homomorphism. Okay, so look, these are the ingredients. You've got the free monoid sigma star. We've got the arbitrary finite monoid M. Sigma star, of course, is certainly not finite. And we've got some given subset designated in advance. So this is just a subset. It's not a submonoid. Just a subset. And then we'll define the language of this pair M or this triple MFH is defined to be the set of words in sigma star such that H of W belongs to F. We'll say that's the language of this monoid theorem. A language is regular if and only if it is recognized by some triple M F H. So even though this thing doesn't talk about machines, circles and arrows and things moving around, it's pure algebra. It's actually equivalent to that deterministic finite automaton definition. So I think this is a homework question. Prove that anytime you have a language recognized by a DFA, I can construct a monoid to recognize it. And conversely, supposing I've got a monoid recognizing it in this way, I can construct a DFA. So that even these are different ways of saying the same thing. So I'm going to define an equivalence relation based on a language. Given a language L in sigma star, we define which is an equivalence relation and how does it go we'll say x is equivalent sub ly if for all z in sigma star x z is in l if and only if yz is an L. Okay. <clears throat> so obviously, if I take for my z epsilon, 
then I'm saying X is an L if and only if Y is an L. All right. So fact, which I think fact means I'm not going to bother to prove it. You should prove, I think this thing you can prove in your head. Um, <clears throat> if X is congruent to Y and U is congruent to V, then X U is congruent to Y V. It's either trivial or false. I'm not absolutely sure which, but you, <laughs> I think I think it's true actually. Okay, good. <clears throat> so this is called a, a, a thing that, uh, an equivalence relation that respects the algebraic structure is called a congruence relation. So that's stronger than just an equivalence relation. It's an equivalence relation that also interacts nicely with the algebra. So for all those algebra freaks like uh, Maria out there, you're probably familiar with the concept of normal subgroup <clears throat> or, the, or an ideal in a ring. So those things are defining congruence relations for their respective algebra structures. So this is analogous. You can think of this as the baby monoid version of the concept of ideal. Okay, uh, so when you have a congruence relation, sigma star, quotiented by this is a well-defined monoid. So once you've got a monoid and once you've got a language, you get another monoid by quotienting by that language. <clears throat> and regular languages have nice properties that can be investigated by studying this monoid. And indeed, now's the time for all the group theory fans to come out of the woodwork. <laughs> if this monoid turns out to be a group, then extraordinary things happen. And this, you know, this looks like a very toy and elementary theory, but there's a whole subject there called the algebraic theory of automata and the algebraic theory of regular languages and all kinds of uh, quite technically difficult theorems that I am absolutely not going to teach you <laughs> flow out of this algebraic viewpoint of, on regular languages. Okay, I have run one minute over. So I am going to say goodbye. With any luck, I will be able to successfully upload this recording. I'm still feeling my way around. I'm recording it through my courses. Um, but you know, my course is filled with flakiness. So I'm not absolutely sure if all this works, but at least I have the notes which can be posted, but hopefully also the recording. Anyway, same time tomorrow. See you all on Tuesday and uh, good luck. Bye. 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 Thank you, Professor. Bye, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. You're welcome. Come. Uh, Thank you. Okay, let me check out what's being happening on the chat. Mm. I think it is like the integers. Okay, very good. So, stop recording. <laughs>